So welcome everyone. We've got a really good session today. Uh, we've got a mix of molecular, heavy duty, big data kind of projects and some really interesting assays and technologies as well to talk about. Um, I'm going to kick things off. So my name is Ben Cross. Uh, I'm going to chair the session, but I'll speak first as well. And I'm going to present some of our uh, technology and some of our findings in the application of, of, of CRISPR technologies, mostly in the context of functional genomic screening. So as many of you may know, uh, pharma has a problem. Uh, the escalating costs of R&D and the diminishing returns for these, these efforts is something which has plagued uh, pharmaceutical discovery for sort of 10 years or so really now. And at Horizon, we think one of the solutions to that is around personal, personalized genomics. And we're looking at applications of technologies which can streamline these processes, provide better opportunities for validated targets. And some of the things I'm going to try and present are some of the technologies we think are critical in this kind of application. So functional genomic screening, which is going to be the, the main focus of what I'll talk about today, is you know, an extraordinarily powerful technology and has been for many years. But with CRISPR coming on board, it's really changed the kind of quality and the, and the properties of the sorts of data that you're able to generate on a very, very large scale. So in essence, this is you know, about linking genotype to phenotype on a very large scale, potentially up to the whole genome level. So you can ask the question, how does gene X, gene Y, and all the way up to gene 20,000 uh, influence any disease physiology that you're really interested in studying? And the interesting thing about this kind of approach, and in particular with CRISPR technologies, is the surprisingly broad applicability across drug discovery uh, pipelines, I guess, so that you can start to explore uh, the application of this kind of technology in a very early stage in, in, in really kind of hypothesis-free discovery programs and all the way right up to almost preclinical analysis. In fact, even beyond that, if you're thinking about bioproduction, which we, we won't touch on too much today. So I'm going to use as a vehicle for describing how we've been using these technologies, um, mostly things like mechanism of action analysis with um, small molecule compounds, but I hope you'll be able to see the sort of broader uh, opportunities that are possible with this kind of approach. So pool screening, which is what I'll talk about, is, you know, been around for a long time with SHRNA, and many of those technologies were adapted to, to the uh, use of CRISPR, CRISPR uh, approaches. And really, in essence, it's about taking a, a decision tree which starts with how many genes you want to think about targeting. You look at the whole genome, you look at specific uh, subsets of, of genes, and then bringing those genetic pertur perturbing technologies into cells on a very, very large scale in a pooled format and deconvoluting the data that you generate from a particular assay using deep sequencing. That's how you uh, understand what's really happened in your experiment. And I'll try and describe how we uh, have been doing that. But in, in broader terms, there are kind of two readouts, I guess, that we most commonly are drawn to. That is survivability. How long does a genotype persist under a given condition? And that could be you know, a differentiation condition, the application of a drug. It could be um, a, a more complex, nuanced physiology. Or a phenotypic uh, readout, which is, broadly speaking, read out by high-throughput flow cytometry. And in terms of what the sorts of studies we've been doing with this, a lot of what we've been doing is around drug-gene interaction screening. So this is asking the question, how does a particular drug influence uh, the physiology of a particular cell uh, in the context of genetic changes, which you introduce in a very systematic fashion? Um, similarly, we've done a lot of work in uh, synthetic lethal target discovery in oncology, and this is about asking the question, how do different uh, collections of cells or even panels or genotypes of cells respond differentially to a particular gene perturbation? So you can, say, uh, identify genetic vulnerabilities in, in a particular KRAS mutation or something similar. Biomanufacture screening allows you the opportunity to screen for uh, high producing uh, clonal variants, and you can do that in the context of discovery or in the context of engineering as well. And pool phenotypic screening, which is um, something I won't talk too much about today, but that we've done quite a bit of, allows you the opportunity to uh, use a, a complex phenotypic readout and, and collect separate populations by flow cytometry and deep sequence, deep sequence them individually. And that allows you the chance to ask how does genotype uh, one and two influence uh, the emergence of a particular biomarker property or, or an expression level of a gene that you're interested in. That could be a very powerful approach. But today, I'm going to focus on, on one particular issue, which is um, amongst all the many different kinds of screens we've conducted over the past two or three years, one of the things which remains uh, a persistent challenge is the ability for us to detect 
at the whole genome level and with a high degree of sensitivity, those things which are uh, of, a, of a rare event. So a particularly good example of that is if you were conducting something like a mechanism of action analysis or a, a drug interaction study, and you wanted to find genes which, when you applied them, uh, were enhancing the, the, uh, the potency of a particular drug. And because that event usually results in some sort of cytotoxic process or a, or a rare, rarer event, it makes them more challenging to uh, identify. So it's a kind of technological barrier that we've been working quite hard to try and resolve and provide some additional uh, clarity to. So I'm going to try and explain some of the things that we've done that we think has um, really helped this. So the first thing that we did, which was a few years ago, is just think about some of the basic infrastructure of CRISPR technologies. So when you have your Cas9 endonuclease and you have a, an RNA component as well, it's important to think, as, as we and, and many others now have come to conclude, that you're using the, the appropriate uh, tools and technology. And so the adaptation of uh, the tracer sequence itself, which was conducted um, by uh, initially in the context of doing um, large-scale time-lapse GFP tracking for telomere function has made a huge improvement into the frequency of homozygous knockout that you can generate. And so that makes this a kind of no-brainer in terms of using the appropriate technology. In this instance, we're looking at uh, lethality using a Bayes factor analysis where uh, we take a Bayes score um, to indicate the level of essentiality of a given knockout and taking a collection of positive and negative selection genes uh, in this instance. So these would be, for the most part, things like ribosomal genes, so are broadly essential. And then looking at the differential between these two populations in terms of the adaptation. And you can see there's a beautiful separation and it's a much, much more clean and improved system. But not to be forgotten, the influence of cell background and the, the frequency the, or the success rate of CRISPR technologies for knockout, for simple knockout in this case, uh, varying across many, many different cell line panels and how that will influence your dynamic range and your experimental design is quite crucial as well. So that's one way to get improved efficacy for CRISPR knockout technologies in the context of pool screens. <clears throat> Um, another way is, is what we've been using, using a lot is haploid genomics, so the simplicity genetically of these tools it allows you to generate kinetically quicker phenotypes because of the, rapid, uh, the rapidity of the knockout and also in many cases cleaner data sets. And here's one example where we conducted the kind of screen that I was describing as challenging, that is a sensitivity screen. Uh, so here we ask the question, what genes uh, enhance the cytotoxicity of paclitaxel when we knock them out? Uh, and we were able to identify a number of kinases and sub subsequently validate them. But in most instances, people don't want to work with a haploid system because it doesn't appropriately model their physiological system. And there we need to find solutions which can be broadly deployed to help improve data quality wherever we can. And so today I'm going to try and describe to you the application of two new tools. So most of what we've done over the past two years is CRISPR knockout. But of course, CRISPR-I and CRISPR-A have been around for a couple of years too. And we've been using them mostly in the context of um, target validation. But around a year ago, we really became very excited about how we could use these tools in, uh, in pooled, large-scale screening technologies. And some of the key things which really triggered that change in our perspective, firstly, around the turn of, sort of Christmas time, 2016 to 2017, there was the discovery in our labs and others um, that revealed some of the sort of vulnerabilities, maybe, or chinks in the armor, I guess, of CRISPR knockout technologies. And specifically, this resulted to copy number, uh, in the context of amplified re, uh, loci or in uh, cells with a high degree of aneuploidy. And these would frequently result in multiple cuts, unavoidable multiple cuts with a CRISPR editing technology because the sequence is replicated and is, cannot be uh, targeted selectively. And this results in a, a, a pretty much catastrophic DNA damage response, which is broadly considered to be an off-target consequence. So it doesn't result from the, the loss of function at a given loci. It results just from cells having a, a, a number of sort of 5, 10, 15 simultaneously cut, simultaneous cuts to their genome. So that gives an opportunity to think about some different technologies which don't necessarily have an editing component and how we can use those to, to uh, explore gene function. And secondly, um, the really great work done at UCSF in John Wiseman's lab which uncovered some additional strategies and tools for identifying good guide sequences. So good guide sequences is a really important thing to think about and in the case of CRISPR-I and CRISPR-A as, I, as I'll show you, these technologies require slightly different considerations to CRISPR knockout since they, they have a, a demand for constitutive binding to their loci as I'll show. And so here they were able to identify um, predictively regions which are tightly bound in the nucleosome regions and avoid those to generate a much, much higher degree of efficacy for the tools that they were using. So that really then escalated the, the quality of data that you're able to generate with the CRISPR-I 
sort of tool uh, to the level that you can see with CRISPR knockout. So the sort of penetrance of the effect was almost equivalent, whether you're repressing or, or knocking out. So CRISPR-I, first of all, um, I'm going to show you some data we generated with these tools. So this is a, both CRISPR-I and CRISPR-A uh, are technologies which allow you to control transcription using the Cas9 infrastructure, and both use a catalytically dead Cas9 um, to drive a, an adapted functionality from the molecular infrastructure. In the case of CRISPR-I, you fuse, uh, in this case, a crab domain to it, which stabilizes the complex. You target to a specific genomic locus, normally around the transcriptional start site or just downstream. And this, quite simply, sterically blocks the access of transcription factors and RNA polymerase to repress gene transcription at those loci. And the applications are, are, are orthologous to some extent to CRISPR knockout, but also alternative. There are, there are ways that this technology uh, can be used that maybe wouldn't be captured very well by CRISPR knockout, including you know, the simulation of drug ability, which may be better represented by repression rather than complete gene ablation in terms of how likely your drug, it, your drug is to uh, affect those levels of gene change. And similarly, looking at non-protein coding regions. But most, I think, exciting for us, as we're still learning about CRISPR-I, is the opportunity to use it in parallel with CRISPR knockout technologies, or CRISPR-A, as I'll describe. So to try and validate these technologies, we looked at a proof of concept study, and this is sort of schematic for that. Um, this is looking at, you know, relatively low-hanging fruit in that we're looking at uh, resistance phenomena emerging at the genetic level to the BRAF inhibitor, vemurafenib. Um, vemurafenib uh, targets specifically B V600E, so we took A375 cells, we transduced them with whole genome libraries in, uh, for CRISPR-I or CRISPR-A, and we explored then following treatment what genotypes would selectively confer a degree of resistance to that otherwise cytotoxic dose of this inhibitor. Yeah. And the reason we wanted to do this is, 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 is there are multiple reasons. This is a very clinically relevant phenomenon since BRAF uh, resistance emerges quite rapidly in melanoma patients. There's also some sort of existing data sets, I guess, that we could benchmark against and some known both loss of function and gain of function mutations which can drive this resistance. So it's a relatively neat system for us to explore this, um, the, the performance of our tools in this, in this study. So I'll jump straight into the data because I want to talk about some of the combinations afterwards. But the CRISPR-I data screen worked very beautifully. Uh, the genes highlighted are on this plot on the left-hand side show you, uh, broadly speaking, a sort of one-sided volcano plot. So we've got a uh, resistance index in log two along the x-axis and a, a p-value of sorts on the y-axis. And those genes which are highlighted show you a, uh, the, the things we expected to see. And you can see there are a number of things that we hadn't seen previously in other studies. And one of the important things we did identify was a, a substantial increase in the number of complex, uh, components of the med complex that we identified, um, shown here but not necessarily highlighted. And importantly, that the, the top hit, MED12, which interacts with the mec erc pathway and mix signaling as well, uh, was found to be enriched by around 16,000-fold. And, and based on the way we conducted the study, um, that's almost approaching the maximum level of uh, expected sensitivity that we could uh, expect to see in these um, experiments, assuming, of course, no dramatic growth rate changes from the knockout of MED12 or knockdown in this case. So that was a really exciting thing because it looks like we're approaching the saturation point of how well these technologies work, which is really nice to see. Down here, we've also got some guide level data just to give you an indication of the sort of performance of these libraries on the hits that we identified. And the interesting thing we found, which we maybe weren't expecting to see, was that just like CRISPR knockout technologies, the reproducibility of the magnitude of the effect, so we've got a, this resistance index now on the y-axis this time, and each bar being a different guide, was, was very, very reproducible. And that's exactly what you see with CRISPR knockout technologies, and is exactly why CRISPR is uh, providing so much cleaner data sets than things like SHRNA screening. Because what you really want is that high degree of reproducibility in your study so that you can discover with much higher degree of clarity, with better statistics, the real hits that emerge from the rest of the data noise. But you can also see that there's some room for improvement. Uh, and that, I think, is a good uh, thing to think about when it comes to CRISPR-A and CRISPR-I, that there may be less mature data sets uh, compared to knockout technologies, and maybe we can start to think about how to improve these libraries. So immediately, the, the opportunity of having a second loss of function technology provided some exciting possibilities, since we were able to think about how we could combine these data sets to, to gain more in terms of data, in terms of hit identification. So each data set did indeed reveal a unique signature of hits, 
but we could also think about how we could uh, combine these data sets. And the, the, that's an in silico operation which might seem relatively trivial, but the, the, the use of it is that you get two completely different data sets in the CRISPR-I and CRISPR knockout, but if you pool them, they have totally different uh, guide sequences, and you can simulate the effect of a higher complexity library, since now you have multiple guides targeting each gene. And that potentially provides you in an, with an additional layer of sensitivity to the sorts of studies you're doing. And in the case of this, that means you might be able to achieve the, the, the level of sensitivity from a relatively straightforward whole genome screen that you might have expected from a much uh, smaller focus, uh, more concentrated screen. And you can see that when we looked at control populations of non-essential versus essential genes, we did indeed see that these, these two populations were, were separated slightly better when we pooled these data sets bioinformatically. I think this is not the best example. In this particular case, these two cell lines didn't actually respond that well to the CRISPR-I, which was quite interesting for us. But I think it nevertheless it provides an interesting case study to explore further. OK, so what about CRISPR-A? So CRISPR-A, um, the tool that we use is either the VPR system or the, or the, or the SAM system, which I think have been discussed already very nicely at this, uh, this conference by others. Um, the SAM system uses a, a very complex sort of system, I suppose, but in the case of doing a pool study, that's not such a big problem because you, you can set up that infrastructure quite early before you bring in the guide sequences, so it's uh, not too uh, prohibitive in terms of the sorts of experiments you want to do. And of course, this technology, because it drives upregulation of gene expression from the specific loci that you target it to, uh, provides totally new kinds of opportunities for discovery. When we, when we do any of these screens, we tend to have a, a set of control genes and guides that we like to monitor that gives us an indication of the dynamic range of the experiment and the performance in terms of quality. Um, and they tend to be essential genes which are easy to trace because we see them dropping out. With CRISPR-A we don't have that opportunity because obviously knocking up an essential gene is not going to have the same phenomena. But we did identify a number of uh, important cell cycle inhibitors for which overexpression drives the same sort of phenotypic response. That is loss of viability that you can detect quite easily with the experiment that we design. And so we're starting to build a set, that, a set of sort of control genes that would allow us to validate or, or uh, evaluate the, the quality of any screen that we do in the, same as, in the same way as we do for a loss of function screen. So the, the actual vemorafinib resistance screen that we conducted as a proof of concept, again, found lots of the, the sorts of components that we'd expect to see. Um, uh, receptor tyrosine kinases, and importantly, EGFR, were, were came out as the top hit, just as you'd expect. And again, this was enriched by around 16,000 folds, so it's starting to approach the maximum degree of sensitivity you'd expect from this study. And we also found, for the first time, gratifyingly BRAF, which hadn't been identified, but would again be expected to drive a resistance effect. Uh, since the, if you overexpress that component, you'd expect some degree of shift in the IC50 of the drug which you apply. So that was good to see. But what we're really interested in is how we can combine these data sets, and in particular looking for what we hoped to see, which was gene opposing effects. So take hypothetically a gene which uh, you silence using something like CRISPR-I or CRISPR knockout, and you expect to see, or you do rather see, uh, a resistance phenomena emerging. You might then hypothesize that applying the opposite kind of technology in terms of directionality, that is CRISPR-A, to upregulate that gene, you would see the opposite phenotypic phenomena ar ar arising, in, that, in this case, sensitivity. But it could equally be upregulation of a gene of interest and downregulation of a gene of interest, depending on what you're doing. And likewise, the other way around, you might expect to see CRISPR-A and I interacting at this level, uh, the genetic context. So we looked to see whether or not we could see that. And we indeed could see that on many of the loci that we were targeting, uh, not every one, um, for, for reasons of the way the experiment was designed and because biology is more complex than, than that. But it was good to see that many of these targets did indeed show these, uh, these gene opposing effects. And the reason why that's important is because, one, that it validates the phenomena within two independent different uh, studies. But two, as I'll try and describe later, it opens up an opportunity to use a high sensitivity study to identify things that were previously uh, difficult to discover with, the, with a uh, sensitivity mechanism. So that is, you can say, well, if I identify that a resistance mechanism occurs when I downregulate this particular gene, maybe I can then see, uh, without having to have actually uh, done a very, very difficult to do experiment, I can uh, hypothesize that the opposite phenomena would also be true if I looked at it with, a, with the opposing directionality technology. And that's, in, that's important because, broadly speaking, a, a positive selection screen is easier to conduct than a, a negative selection screen. So that's uh, something we're quite excited about. But the other thing that's exciting is the opportunity to explore gene networks in a, in a more uh, thorough fashion. 
And this is one example we had of this in this study, where we, we were able to identify that the anti-apoptotic component, MCL1, showed a, a high degree of um, uh, sensitivity uh, when we inactivated it with CRISPR-I. That is, loss of MCL1 drove these cells more rapidly to apoptosis when we treated them with the drug. And that's exactly what you'd expect. But of course, because we know that uh, MCL1 direct, uh, directly or indirectly has these interacting partners, including NOXA and BIM, we could look at those components as well. And in this case, when we looked at NOXA, which directly inhibits MCL1, we can see the exact opposite phenomena occurring. That is that you now see that sensitivity phenomena occurring with the CRISPR-A technology, so driving upregulation of this inhibitory component of MCL1 had the same effect as directly targeting MCL1. So now you can start to see how you can connect dots across your screens by having both data sets available to you. And being able to now explore biology dual directionally, which is how biology normally works, in, in even it's, that's probably even a simple explanation of how most of uh, these studies work. You can start to connect gene networks together and see uh, a much, much more complete picture. And also start to think about how you might uh, use that to leverage hit identification, where you're not always going to be able to see in the top 10, 5, 50 hits in your, in your study, the things which you actually might want to then progress in terms of drug ability or target validation. And having a better opportunity to see a complete gene network, maybe you'll then see that right in the nexus of that network is the thing that is most likely to respond better to your drug discovery pipeline. Um, so that's a very interesting way to think about the possibilities here. And then maybe slightly esoteric, but I think very interesting. If you combine these two data sets of, uh, of CRISPR-I and CRISPR-A and think about what actually emerged in, uh, in the cross-sections, what we then identified is almost uniquely and fairly unambiguously, maybe fairly rarely, the, the drug target itself, that is BRAF. So here we can see that BRAF appears in this uh, sort of uh, this, this, uh, this uh, 45 degree angle of the data sets as you array them together. And that indicates that it responds with a resistance phenomena in the case of either inactivating it or activating it. So quite an unusual response. In the case of BRAF, that's explained most likely by the uh, paradoxical activation that vemurafenib drives in the absence of BRAF. So that is, if, if BRAF isn't there, vemurafenib binds CRAF, and that drives a, a sort of a proliferative, and in this case, a, a pseudo-resistance phenomena that was identified by the response of that, the CRISPR-I in this case. But I think that's interesting because it opens up the possibility uh, that this dual screening technology can provide a very, very uh, clean dissection of drug mechanism of action. Not all drugs will respond like this, as I say, but it's not uncommon to think about how it, you, can, you can limit the, the damage or, or rather the risk of your experiment by having to guess a priori how genes are going to interact with a given compound and whether or not they will phenocopy it when you knock them out and therefore be invisible or whether or not they will enhance the effect of that drug and therefore be very visible. So doing these two screens together gives you that opportunity uh, to get a, a much more complete picture. And we're not the only people thinking in these terms, and uh, John Weissman's group published last year on a very similar sort of phenomena, looking at the deorphaning of this, of this compound, which was then identified to be a microtubule destabilizing agent. So I think this is a new way of thinking about how to do, in particular, drug mechanism action studies, but also many biological pursuits could be benefited from taking a, a, a dual screening based approach. So I'm not going to spend too much time uh, talking about uh, array technologies, but needless to say, there are many contexts for, for genetic studies where a pool study is not possible because of complex co-culture or cell autonomous effects or because you need some degree of high content uh, to read out in a particular physiology. And uh, from that perspective, then we've also been developing tools which can help us query both uh, from the loss of function using RNAi or CRISPR knockout technologies, or now uh, very, very pleased to say that we also have a pr equivalent technologies being developed um, in the case of cr synthetic CRISPR A reagents. So this allows you to either do smaller targeted follow-up experiments using a gene activation based approach, or indeed uh, larger scale array studies for those for those physiologies which can't be mapped out easily by, by pooled or flow cytometry based readouts. So as we're kind of trying to put all these things together, we're starting to build a bit more of a com complete workflow where you can think about discovery that, that leads on from a, 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 a large scale functional genomic study. Uh, you can include uh, multiple different approaches, including CRISPR knockout, CRISPR I, and CRISPR A, and, in, and often batch these up and pair them and couple them so that you can get much deeper and more informative data sets allow you to do a whole genome or, or even maybe slightly more focused primary screening exercise. And then secondary screening or follow-up validation can be conducted either in pooled using ultra-complex tile-based experiments where you look at, say, 
tiling guides across functional domains to explore target validation, or in more, um, more uh, targeted arrayed experiments using um, either multiplex or high content based imaging. Um, once you need to start to understand how that gene really is functioning uh, in, your, in, your, in your disease physiology with more temporal resolution or with more uh, impact on uh, additional biomarkers, then there are some inducible tools that can be very valuable to helping to understand that. And then ultimately you might want to represent these uh, discoveries in a model such as a cell line or, a, or an animal, and again that's something that uh, we're starting to put these things tied together. And importantly many of these have uh, overlapping or orthologous tools available so that you can actually gain a degree of reproducibility and a degree of, uh, of validation from that, that exercise. All right, so I will finish there. I think I'm broadly on time. And thank the, 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 the people who contributed to this from my lab and from Horizon more, more generally, and of course from the Darmacon team. And uh, I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Hey, Benedict, thanks for a great talk. Uh, when you compare the CRISPR I versus the CRISPR knockout in just straight viability screening, do you see different classes of genes being more sensitive to one technology versus the other? So, yes, I think yeah, the short answer to that is that we do, because we, we have an, 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 an analogous CRISPR knockout screen of that bemorafin resistance study that allows us to do that cross comparison quite nicely. And what we do see is that CRISPR I appeared to be more sensitive in the detection of essential genes. And that's kind of what you'd expect to see because in the case of a drug study, if you drop out an essential gene, it becomes quite close to the undetectable level quite quickly. Whereas in a repression screen, you might have a, be a slightly bigger window for discovery when it comes to the interaction analysis. So we did indeed see different classes. I would say though that a better kind of fair answer is that we're still learning that. And so for example, we do see quite distinct cell line differences, which I hinted at there. The A375, for example, responded remarkably to the knockout of the sorts of genes, or the knockdown of the sorts of control subset genes that we use in the knockout studies, whereas other cell lines we've looked at haven't done. So there is obviously some nuance there associated with how different cell lines respond. Um, but definitely the overall story is that there are distinct subsets and these two technologies are likely to yield slightly different hits as you'd expect from the biological effect that you're driving. <laughs>